There is a concept that exists within all of us that is fairly odd, and it's called the uncanny valley. When something is just almost human, but just kind of isn't. So when something is clearly not human and doesn't move in a human way, our jimmies remain quite unrustled. When something looks human and moves like a human, again, we think nothing about it. The combination of something either looking human and moving in an inhuman way, or looking inhuman, but moving in a human manner, both respectively either inspire fear in the former and curiosity in the Ladder. So the question is, why exactly do we fear something that looks human, but isn't exactly human? In many examples and cultures, they have really tried to explain this phenomenon by things like monsters being out in the wilderness, whose specific goal is to lure humans out to their demise. But even today, knowing that these monsters don't exist, it's still something that appears rather primal within our species to fear something that is almost us, but not quite. In a small town in Missouri, quite literally separated by 60 miles of wilderness on either side of it, two friends are attempting to become a viral sensation on VidTube, lol, and record life living in a small town that is quite literally in the middle of nowhere. However, as their series continues, the locals begin acting strangely as the town is quietly besieged by an unknown aggressor. People start going missing left, right, and center, but then turning back up in an altered state, knowing who everyone is, yet not acting like how they would originally. This would ultimately be noticed by the remaining humans of the town, however, it would turn out to be discovered in an untimely manner. So in today's episode, we'll discuss what exactly these creatures from a assimilate are, how they hijack your meat suit in a sense, and ultimately how they steal your mind from you, and then they steal your life. So up on screen you'll see a timestamp, or you can head into the chapters bar. There you can bypass the summary of this movie and get straight into the science. Though I don't know about you guys, but I had no clue this movie actually came out really not that long ago. I usually pride myself on finding these sort of movies, because hey, who doesn't like a good body snatching movie? But this one totally flew under the radar. Anyhow, let's get to why when something tips off part of your brain and says, hey, this thing looks human but doesn't appear human, you should probably listen to that. Because that's your mirror neuron screaming at the rest of your brain that something's wrong and this is definitely a skinwalker. We start off our story with creatures who appear to be even smaller than ants. As they crawl across some leaves, we begin panning over to a house. A young woman inside has called her mother several times that night, and yet she has still received no response. As she begins talking about a bite on her arm and wondering what she should do, people begin showing up outside of her house. Making a break for the door and trying to get in, the woman is able to get the door shut and locked before this person is successful. Looking around, the woman outside then begins circling the house to around back and breaking glass along the way. Way. Eventually, the girl inside remembers that she left the glass door of the backyard open and then runs to close it. However, as she does, the wind runs into it. At first, this stops her, but after a second attempt, it breaks, sending glass flying towards her as presumably she meets her end. Okay, now we meet our two friends, Zack and Randy. On camera, standing with the town as a backdrop is Zack, who immediately looks pained on camera, sort of like how I look on camera. As they walk through the town, they remark how there is quite literally nothing around them and they are literally in the middle of nowhere. There is no crime. People don't lock their doors, and there is really no purpose, as it's 60 miles between them and the next town over, which is also in the middle of nowhere. Actually, I'm not gonna lie, seems like a pretty nice place, but unfortunately the wife would never go for it. Wearing Bluetooth cameras underneath their collars, they walk around town and into a liquor store where they find the underage quarterback getting drinks. The sheriff really doesn't care, and in general, nobody really does anything. Yep, sounds like a small town that I've seen, at least down in Georgia. We now meet Pastor Greg, and get the town's name. Being called Molten, they're roughly about 2.5 blocks of actual town. The pastor, coming out to meet Zack and Randy, asks them if they would like to audition for a play, Jesus Christ Superstar, that he's working on. There will be plenty of girls there apparently, but they are rolling with the God Squad, so I'm not really sure anything is going to be uh, happening besides literally just auditioning for a play. We now jump over to the next building, which has some importance and launched this whole idea. A cable company has recently moved in and connected Molten to the rest of the world with high-speed capable internet, which can kind of, you know, actually make these kids VidTube famous. Nobody ever wants to be VidTube famous. Heading back home, spring has sprung as Miss Bissette is wearing her short shorts, which I think back to my teenage years, I'd probably stop by too just to see, uh, you know, how she was doing. But as she begins talking to them, she sees if they can identify some small bugs on an apple that she has. Getting a good look at them, they almost appear to look like ants, but are much smaller and almost blurry when they move. They're clearly a eusocial species, but as Randy dusts them off, they begin crawling away. Miss Bissette goes on to say that they just started showing up last week, and she has no clue as to what they could be. As they crawl away, 
away. Across the road, a child is being dragged by his mother, and as he protests and keeps pulling away, she doesn't seem to really pay any attention and instead continues to drag him along. As he almost gets out of earshot, we hear him say that she's not his real mother, but everyone around continues on like normal, not wanting to get involved. Call that the bystander effect. Jumping to an over-the-town view, we now begin to see something is amiss. As spores come into view, they are floating towards the town, but do not appear to be fungal or plant as something is crawling around within the center of these spores. And we now get to meet the love interest, because you already know that has to happen. Kayla comes up to Zack and Randy and begins asking them about the cameras, wondering what they are doing. As they tell her, her family comes over and everyone is just, just one big giant functional not body snatched family who loves one another. Man, I hope it lasts. So anyways, as it turns out, she's going to a different college than Zack, and Randy tells him basically he needs to stop being such a huge loser about it and just ask her out. Later that night, as Zack is coaching Kayla through something that she's trying to do, which if I recall, if you want to mess with the modem settings by entering the IP address, I don't think you could be on Skype as it requires the internet to do something. Yeah, I'm sure somebody will probably tell me something different in the comments. Anyways, as a kid named Joey comes in and says he's a mutant and then it ends, it's not really that important. Then we flash over to Randy's house. His mom is a little loose, as you know. So the next night we meet Zack's parents. The mom is cooking dinner, but we figure out that dad appears to have been injured, but is also addicted to pain pills, likely because of his injury, which is actually a huge problem right now in the United States. Um, if for any particular reason you get massively injured, I know it sucks, but if you can deal with the pain rather than taking, uh, like, opioids and stuff, deal with the pain. Because that crap is massively addictive. Kind of a bad topic, I know, but a lot of people seem to think that just because doctors prescribe it, that it must be safe. No, it's not. Anyways, back to uh, lighter topics about people getting body snatched. After dinner, Zack and Randy head out to throw the frisbee around when they begin hearing yells from Miss Bissett's house. Entering the home, they find evidence of a struggle, but aren't sure if she's still alive. Finding a lamp on the floor and a blood trail, they call the cops, but then the sheriff hangs up on them. They begin hearing something crawl around them, and following the blood trail, they head into a nursery of Miss Bissett's and find her in the closet with with her leg having been bitten. She says she doesn't know what bit her, and then a creature comes out flying out of the wall as Zack and Randy go give chase because it might have rabies, so they need to capture it before it escapes. Running through the woods, they begin gaining on it before stopping. A car pulls up and picks up Pastor Greg, who has picked up the creature that bit Miss Bissett. Returning back to Mrs. Bissett's house, she calls her husband, who is on some sort of business trip, and he seems fairly uninterested in returning home. The next day, as Randy and Zack go to City Hall and the police station to kind of get them to look at the footage, they are stopped by Mr. Swolger status, who gets upset because they posted their video online of him buying drinks, which gets his Xbox taken away. He then has a real gamer moment as Officer Josh comes out to stop the fighting before it starts breaking out. They then show Josh the video, and Josh says that he thinks it's fake because they have been faking videos for their web show or something like that. So now the cops don't believe him, which is always great. We then get another flyover of the town. More spores are heading in as Randy and Zach get an awesome idea. It's like, oh, you know what we should do? We should, uh, we should go to that guy guy who's been putting bugs in people's houses that's biting them. So let's go hit up Pastor Greg, which <laughs> that just sounds like a really bad idea, right? But I'm guessing uh, Jesus Christ Superstar didn't go off like he wanted it to, so now he's exacting revenge. As they approach the steps, they begin to hear a strange howl in the distance and aren't really sure what it is. Heading into the creepiest part of the church, as you do, they find Pastor Greg sitting in a room with a few others. Nobody appears to be really moving or doing anything, and as they ask Pastor Greg what he's doing and why he released a bug in Mrs. Bess Set's house, he insults their parents and doesn't really care that they actually have footage of him doing this. He just kind of says so. So as they head back outside, they check their phones and now find that they have no service. They then decide that they're going to head back to Mrs. Bissett's house to see if she remembers seeing Pastor Greg at all around anywhere. She pulls up her dress when they get there to show that there's no bite. They say that they have footage of her screaming and she simply replies with so? Ah yes, a very human reaction. So this is how I 300% know I would have got body snatched back in the day. She decides to change the subject and says that, you know, you can come back into my bedroom with me. And like I said, as a teenager, I would be a dead man. However, they are more intelligent than I am and decline, instead sneaking around the house and finding that Mr. Jock had actually gotten the same offer and then chose the same path. Running back to Zack's workshop, they now show Zack's parents, to which they think he's just lying as well. But as Zack looks at the footage, they realize that it's the same guy. Just then, Kayla arrives and says that her dad is acting strange, cold and distant with no feeling in him. Zack and Randy both say that they have been seeing the same thing 
happening all over town as well. Kayla convinces Randy and Zach to come with her to find her mom and get Joey out of the house. As they walk through town, a cable man is working in the middle of the night, people are burning stuff in their yards and driveways, and in general, everyone is acting like a complete weirdo. Basically, that's when you walk into the woods and just straight up nope out of there. Entering Kayla's house, they find that the dad is playing with a doll that he has torn apart, and first things first, this man has excellent posture, we should all strive to look like this. He tells her that everything is fine, and then Zach asks to use the bathroom, but really, it's to look for the bomb. As he looks around, he can't really find anyone until he hears a noise upstairs in the attic. Heading up, he eventually sees something in the corner before being grabbed by Joey. He came up here to find his mother as well, because his dad was acting strange. Meanwhile, downstairs, the dad starts getting kind of suspicious and goes upstairs. Realizing he's coming, he tells Joey to hide in his room as he runs for the bathroom in the master bedroom. Getting in there, the dad starts banging on the door, and he washes the dirt off his hand, and then goes to put the towel on the hamper, before finding that mom is crammed in there, which as you might imagine, might be a little alarming. Exiting the bathroom, the father, or whatever the father is, becomes suspicious of them. Zach shows Kayla the video of her mom, to which she says that they need to go back for Joey and get him out of there. The next morning, they call up Josh, who still doesn't appear to be snatched. They show him the video, and he agrees to go do, like, a wellness check. Getting to the house, he goes to check for the body, but can't find anything, which, okay, let's just uh, use our brain and pretend like we're a detective for a second, right? So, the kids got the footage of a body in a hamper. The dad was suspicious of this because the cameras are still running. Josh comes to the house after seeing a body in the video, and then is like, oh, well, yeah, I guess it was just a prank, bro. Like, come on now. He would have moved the body. I mean, I know the mom shows up, but it's like, you gotta go with your gut instinct on stuff. Anyways, Officer Josh asked for an explanation, but now the mom returns, as I just said, and as Kayla hugs her, though, she realizes it's not her mom. Father says that the boys are just playing with Kayla because of her mental illness, and Josh decides that the whole thing, as I said, was just a prank, bro. Also, there's like this one part where Joey's up in his room, and then like the pastor's in there, and just kind of like locks up behind him, like, alien or not, that's pretty bad. Ugh. But anyways, as they walk through town after to kind of get their video uploaded, they realize that there's no service like anywhere. They go back to Zach's house to upload and find something is making a noise in the barn. Randy then asks if anybody ever works in there and Zach says no. Kayla goes to try to find Zach's mom and Randy and Zach then head in to see what is making that noise. They find Zach's dad banging on something. What is that, like a valve cover? I don't know, it's too dark. Anyhow, his dad gets up out of his wheelchair and he's now got a fresh pair of legs. The rest of the town then appears behind behind them and sets down two coolers, releasing the creatures into the barn with them, and then shuts the door, trapping them. It is able to get a bite on Randy as they search for the source of the moaning from inside the barn that they are hearing. As Randy limps along, Zack eventually finds some sort of incubation pod with a version of his mom inside. Unfortunately, Zack has now seen his mom in the nude, and now will never really recover psychologically. They find Zack's mom as the creature Vulcan mind melds with her, and Zack stabs the creature through the chest as it lets out a howl. Kayla then opens the door to the back of the barn as they all take off and hide as the rest of the changed enter the barn. Night is now beginning to fall as they walk along a road and decide to try again to head to Josh's house. As they see him inside the window, they aren't too sure if it's him, so Zach brings a rock. As he answers the door, it becomes apparent that it's him from his demeanor. As they head inside, Josh shows him that one of the things bit him, but he was able to take out the clone before it was able to mind meld with him. He says that they need to bring this to the FBI, and then they discuss what happens. You get bit, you get clone, you get mind melded, and that's about it. As they look outside, they then spot that naked Randy is coming to play. It jumps onto the trailer as the officer does really not use his brains at all, and then wastes a bunch of shots. Naked Randy now calls for help as the rest of the town shows up around the trailer. There are so many that they are actually able to flip it, and having flipped the trailer, they now start streaming in before grabbing Josh and dragging him off to his doom. Clothed Randy then runs out to lead the pack away from Kayla and Zack. Now that Kayla and Zack are on their own, they decide that they need to get to the next town over. Over. Kayla's mom has a van that they were just going to jack and then drive over there. As they enter the town, however, it's apparent everyone has been body snatched. There's like a giant pile of people on fire in the center. As they attempt to get the one car from the shop, they get spotted. However, mimicking the altered behavior, they are able to blend in and none appear any wiser. Moving through the town and getting to the flower shop, Zach goes in to get the keys when Kayla hears her brother screaming. Having set up like an infection area, they are taking children and having them be Bitten. Why they show a different mentality towards children is strange, regardless, as Kayla goes to get her brother, 
She ends up crying as she sees him freak out, which alerts the other that she's actually not altered. She then tells Joey to run as she's held down and bitten. Zack then crashes through the door and gets her and then they drive off. What's interesting is the infected don't really try to stop them. Instead, they just kind of move out of the way, allowing them to pass. Driving down the road, Kayla mentions how she told Joey to head to the cabin and hide. Zack now realizes that Kayla got bit by the creature. Meanwhile, in the back, it's your friendly neighborhood alien ants. It forms into one of those creatures and then bites Zack before running off into the woods. As they go to give chase, the cops show up to their vehicle as it lets out a howl, alerting the others. Walking through the woods, they eventually find that hundreds of them are waiting around the parameter of the town, so there's really no way they're just walking out of there anymore. Zack decides that they need to head back to the cable company to upload it to the backbone of the internet, as he says. And as they head back into the woods, Randy shows back up. Spotting Zack fairly quickly, he's not exactly acting right, but they don't know if he's been infected or not. However, they determine pretty quickly that Randy also got got. He has all of Randy's memories, but none of the feelings associated with them. Kayla attacks him with a rock, knocking him into the water, as Zack is forced to drown him as he lets out a howl, indicating that his friend is in fact mega gone. Out at the cable building, Zack and Kayla run in while the group isn't looking. Walking along, they find that the lights are not working as well, and all of a sudden, we get a jump scare of naked Zack, who's shown up, player three has entered the game. He attempts to mind meld with Zack for a moment as, all right, now we got naked Kayla showing up. As they run, they eventually lock themselves in the terminal room and upload their footage, which by the way, the YouTube page doesn't actually look like that. Usually it's just the word copyright with a bunch of exclamation points. As they wait for the naked twins to run in, Zack spots a CO2 fire support suppression system. They then let in the clones to which they head to the computers and the originals leave because they know that they can't actually breathe in carbon dioxide. This ultimately results in the end of their clones. As Kayla and Zack leave, they're able to walk out like they are infected as the others assume that they are. Eventually they take off back towards the woods before getting back to Kayla's cabin where they find Joey sitting and watching TV. As they head in and have a uh, little family reunion, we get like M. Night levels of twist here. As it turns out, all over the world the invasion has already completed. They are in fact not the first town to be attacked, but because of their proximity to anything else, they were the last. However, as the video remains uploaded, they start getting comments about how old Roanoke videos were better, and ironically there are still like five people in Boston who probably are making these comments. But it sets it up for the second movie, which honestly would be pretty dope to see. I guess uh, the present virus kind of screwed up, you know, probably filming for all that, so maybe we'll get it in another couple years. But I believe the first place we should start with this creature is where did it come from and what is its designation? Well, as you might imagine, it's pretty clear it's not an Earth-born organism. While there are no indicators from specifically the movie where they may have come from, from, considering the rest of the planet had already been taken over by the time it reached Molten, it likely still did come from outside of Earth's sphere of influence, potentially via either some form of meteor or meteorite. It would have to be small enough as the destruction did not seem prevalent, and this whole thing appeared to fly under the radar until it was too late. Upon entering Earth's atmosphere, whether it hit the ground or not is pretty much irrelevant, and considering the creatures appear to be housed in spore-like sacks that are capable of drifting through the air currents, this would ensure that there really wouldn't be an area untouched by the influence of these body snatchers. As the creatures spread across the planet, it would seem to me that they would really be designated as a parasite more than anything else. They appear to rely on the native fauna of a new planet that they touch down on to become something more than what they are. However, even with that being the case, they are not necessarily one organism even in their completed forms, but instead many different individuals working in a colony, although their end goal seems rather vague by at least how they conduct themselves. So let's take a look at the life cycle of these creatures to determine why in fact they are parasites. Floating through the air, they eventually touch down on the ground, but due to their size, if they were simply land-based organisms, it would take an extremely long time for them to move through an area to begin the infection process. Imagine a bug that tiny attempting to traverse the entire continent. You would be talking about years, if not decades, but by then, the host species would become quite apparent of its presence, making the invasion likely a complete failure. But upon touching down, the spore would burst, and this would release a tiny colony of these creatures. Moving in the undergrowth of Earth, there must be some intelligence of them based on a hive mind or a collective intellect. The individual bug, while not very smart, may be able to link up with others of its own species to increase their overall effective intelligence. And I feel like they're doing this mainly because there are tons of bugs everywhere, so why would these creatures not choose 
bugs to infect, but only choose humans. So there must be some sort of end goal for them that they're doing on purpose. So you can kind of think of them as essentially just moving neurons that can detach and reattach to one another to increase their capabilities. For instance, when Zack and Kayla are in the van, a group of these creatures have been tasked with getting Zack's DNA. Forming one of these biters, they're able to move faster and go on the offensive and then get away before getting caught. We know that this specific creature is now formed from the many rather than just the one. However, it would appear that this creature, without some priming, is not capable of moving past this point. While they can go from tiny individuals to a larger single biting version, or pretty much a physical representation of the colony, it would appear that they require hosts from the planet before becoming something larger than that. And this is what makes them parasites, the requirement of a host to reach the next stage of their life cycle. After acquiring a host, they enter a period of gestation where the creature will grow into that person based on the DNA that they have acquired and become the original host. But then the question is, how might they do this? Well, you know, Papa Roanoke has got at least a hypothesis for that, and it's simply what is stored within us. So taking a hard left out of here, you ever see like a gecko lose a leg and then regrow it? Or maybe a salamander shed its tail to attract the predator away from the main portion of its body so it can get away? Well, the reason they are able to do this is they possess regeneration of their body components. Now, it's not the entire body, however, say if the animal lost its head or an important organ, then clearly it's not going to regenerate from that. But instead, if it does lose that, it's just straight up worm food. But the point is regeneration exists within these animals and considering all animals are related, why can't humans regenerate? Well, it's been found there is a specific section of what's called junk DNA. This DNA is not really all that necessary for your survival and in a lot of cases is cut off piece by piece during cellular mitosis. This specific piece is actually, at least in certain animals, the key to not just replication of damaged areas from, say, a cut or injury, but the literal regeneration of lost limbs and pieces. I mean, really think about how you came to be. How did your body know to form exactly what you look like and then one day just forget? Why is it humans can't regrow a leg or an arm while other animals can, but we can also repair cuts and other injuries and kind of bounce back from really serious issues that might arise within our body? Well, it appears to come down to junk DNA. In this piece of DNA is housed a switch. While in us, this switch is never again flipped after our initial formation, in other animals, it can be turned on or off at will the cells should damage be detected. However, the interesting part is we are closing in on where this switch may be. We know that with our bodies, about 2% of the DNA codes for proteins. However, the other 98% has varying functions and by inhibiting certain areas in other animals, we may be able to identify where this switch is in us for limb regeneration. What this switch does is quite amazing actually. Early in life, we have something known as EGR or early growth response. With early growth response, this is when you form and become how you look with minor alterations such as genes affecting height, weight gain, muscle mass, you know, the usual stuff. But the actual structure of your body is heavily impacted by EGR because it would literally appear to be formed by direction of the EGR. And also just to point out because, uh, you know, there is a entire orchestra of complex growth mechanisms within you as you are forming, EGR is just part of it. But after you become how you look, all the basic components, from here other genes take over to continue on this growth with, you know, growth plates expanding and puberty causing hair and hormones targeting specific areas to uh, also grow. But as life continues, this gene has long since been shut off. They almost compare it to the body going dark. Any injury too great, loss of limb acquired, or in general, something that would require the actual limb to regrow is lost to us. But it seems kind of stupid, right? I mean, surely it would be better for us to keep growing and repairing as it would help out our reproductive abilities. But there may be a reason that we don't have this ability. Now, this is postulation on my part, but it appears almost risky for the body to keep these genes accessible, which is why they aren't. So think about it. If you were to say slice open your leg really badly, but you're able to get it fixed up, there is a possibility that the regeneration ability would be tripped and the entire leg would begin to grow out of that wound, which as you might imagine, would not be all that great for your body's resources, but also could impact movement later on. It may also be that this growth, should this be left on for more complex animals such as ourselves in comparison to geckos, this could create issues with like cancer growth as one cell goes awry and then begins trying to regenerate another body piece within you. And uh, I don't know about you, but that'd be kind of crappy. I would not want something like a leg forming within my leg or an arm forming within my arm. So after this junk DNA is flipped, this is what in theory could cause regeneration of limbs in humans, although quite a few genes are involved in the process and orchestrating them, maybe foreign to our body after its initial growth period, meaning that we as a species are the ones who have to figure it out using our brains by 
by possibly utilizing things like CRISPR. But the first group to figure out how to actually unlock this capability would usher in a new era of medical technology for humanity in general. But you know who has already figured it out? The body mimicking aliens and assimilate. It would appear interestingly enough, considering they need our blood, that DNA, no matter where these creatures have touched down, it kind of seems like the only game in town concerning the universe means that they are carbon-based organisms, which must be pretty common for this species to be as successful as it is, which also means that these creatures must play by Earth's rules. Which, speaking of, let's talk about that for a moment. Did you happen to notice that Josh was able to take out a clone by doming it, or that Zack was able to take out both Kayla's and his own, utilizing carbon dioxide, which is not compatible with our own metabolisms and cellular respiration? That is fairly interesting. That would indicate that while these creatures are in their single form, or second form as a biter, they are really not so much specialized. After taking the host's DNA, this changes entirely to a specialized cell within the body that would fall under the same rules as our bodies. So things like physical damage and headshots actually work, which we will talk about a little more later on. But for now, let's finish up with the life cycles of these creatures. After acquiring the host's DNA, the entire reason I went into regeneration discussion about human form is because now we have an idea of how these creatures are able to grow the way they do. After taking the human DNA, they would have their own DNA, but would incorporate the entire human genome into their own expression. However, it appears as though these creatures would have a way to interface with the genome and activate certain genes that are desirable, with one of those being the gene switch towards EGR. After being in the cocoon, it would appear that the aliens enter a state of metamorphosis. As the animals on this planet, metamorphosis literally breaks down the original form of the animal as it changes and becomes something completely new with no way of returning back to its original form. And I would think this is what's happening with the creature as well. After becoming the biter, they then enter the pod. And I see one of two things happening. The first is possibly these are insect-like creatures that form a eusocial colony, simply specialized with connections between them that can't be broken. Their bodies become almost like cells, albeit much larger cells as they can be spotted by the naked eye. However, through replication of themselves and with the human genome, they align into what the human form would be and give the appearance of a human. Although they really are just a blank slate without the human's memories or knowledge. And you can almost compare it into say Resident Evil 8 with Lady Dimitrescu and and believe it or not, that's how the Romanians say it. There's gonna be somebody in the comments like, no, it's actually Gamer Crash or something like that. No, you're wrong. I swear to God, I've gotten that comment so much. It is as pronounced or as, as I just pronounced it. I promise you, go ask a Romanian. Anyways, her daughters. You know how her daughters actually turn into basically a cloud of bugs? That would be basically the first kind of way that I think about this use social species and how they form humans. But the second one makes a lot more sense to me. So the second possibility is they actually undergo the process of metamorphosis, which is kind of like how moths would. They quite literally melt down to a degree and change entirely, forming the human body with the same parameters as the original human, except for missing legs in one instance. And I believe this is much more in line with what happens based on what we see concerning the destruction of the meat suits. If the collection of creatures simply made up humans, then something like a headshot would be totally useless against it because they could just simply reform over the area because in theory not one specific point of the body should be in control and instead being a eusocial creature they're all in control as a whole however because they have taken on human characteristics as we all know the brain is the most important organ according to the brain because of this the body snatcher would too have this glaring weakness towards brain destruction but we have also seen they can be ended by disrupting cellular metabolism as well when zach is able to get the upper hand on naked randy which sounds absolutely horrible by keeping him underwater he is able to disrupt disrupt the flow of oxygen long enough, leading to the end of the colony that has formed this body. So by all accounts, their bodies have become human with human constraints and biological constants requiring the incorporation of a host in their DNA, making this creature essentially a parasite reliant on the host to enter the last stage of its life cycle. But by entering the last stage of its life cycle, it will still have the same weaknesses that the host had. Which brings us to the final thing we need to discuss. How in the name of all that is holy does this creature actually Vulcan mind? meld with humans. We have seen specifically with the mother upon doing it, it will result in the host's end. But also these creatures have almost an innate sense of where you are and will beeline for your position in an effort to take you out and complete their full infiltration on your life. While the latter is a little more difficult to explain, the former may actually have some merit as to how it's accomplished. So making a beeline for you, the best I can actually figure for that, at Josh's house when Naked Randy shows 
up. The rest of the town was also there, so it seems like he was actually directed towards there. They don't just inherently know where you are, but based on their communication with other body snatchers, they're able to figure out where you are and get close enough to the area that you're like, oh, hey, look, there, there's me. I need a mind meld. But it does appear specifically for these creatures to take over your body. If we look at how a victim is reacting while doing it and also how the body snatcher is reacting while doing it, it would say to me that it's neural reorganization that's happening while it's doing this. In the process of mind melding, it's fairly quickly accomplished, but the brain would appear to be restructuring itself while they are interfacing with the original human brain. As mentioned in a lot of my videos, we are essentially pathways within a bunch of meat in our skulls. A memory is a connection of neurons all firing in the same pattern that would recreate the memory that we have. Habits are simply longer pathways that fire, which is why it's difficult to break bad habits as those connections become a lot stronger, but due to neuroplasticity, it can be done and new habits can be formed. Essentially, our brain physically changes as we change too, which is actually how we adapt and change to changing situations. There is an idea that if you could map the human brain entirely down to how it fires and how it's structured, you might literally be able to replicate a person and how they think and act. Now, there are still like a ton of unknowns specifically about the brain, which likely would have an impact on this. And if you're religious at all, or, you know, believe in the soul, then the spiritual aspect of that as well, because honestly, we as a species, we just don't know yet. There are still a ton of things about how our bodies work, how our brains work, that is just a complete mystery to basically even the smartest people alive right now. And with our current technological level, mapping isn't essentially a science uh, that's really outside of its infancy yet. But this species, however, would appear to be able to do this via its own personal abilities. It's not explicitly told to us how it is done, but it appears to be a timing thing. The first few seconds where the readings are happening, if it's interrupted, the original person can be saved. If it's allowed to continue to completion, it appears the brain of the original host is destroyed in some capacity. This would indicate to me that it's possible some electrical component may be used to map the brain. Possibly, there are specialized cells on the hands of these clones maintained from its original genetic coding that allows it to use electricity within the brain to map these neurons before information is translated into the brain of the clone. For the original, however, what do we call the brain having all its neurons fire at once even if it's just straight up electricity run through it? Well, it's a seizure, and if it's large enough, it's called tonic-clonic seizure or grand mal. While people have succumbed to these seizures, typically you can survive it. However, it seems the process of the brain undergoing this when it's being scanned, basically, may be too much for it. It's possible that during this the brain is depleted to the point that firing of neurons becomes difficult and the signal is completely interrupted. Now normally this wouldn't be too terrible as if you've ever been knocked out that's pretty much what happened to you, which if you think about it, your consciousness is nothing but an unbroken stream of neurons constantly firing. So when you have been knocked out, did you wake up as the same person in the same consciousness? I've always wondered that because I've been knocked out several times in my life. But anyways, if this happens in an area, say like the brainstem, the heart can actually be stopped by this, which in turn leads to the person meeting their end. And this is what happened to Zach's mom and probably Randy because Randy did get got. With Zach, however, likely it was a seizure-like effect effect building in his brain, but upon Kayla breaking naked Zack's grip, you could tell Zack was still out of it for a few while his brain's normal patterns returned. It looked like quite literally when you get knocked out, I mean, it kind of takes you a second to figure out where are you, what are you doing, why did you run into a wall, or why are you on the ground? But these points on the hand after successfully mapping the brain reorganize its own brain to maintain memories, knowledge, language, and in general interaction with the previous host and the previous host's friends families, whatever. However, why this would be something that works in other animals is because they may not have the complexity of the human social interaction. The aliens just apparently do not necessarily understand what is attached to those specific patterns in our brains, as also chemicals are being co-released with certain patterns that make life memorable. Because of this, things like fishing despite not catching anything seems probably pretty pointless to them, whereas it's a social aspect that humans really crave. So they're actually not truly a perfect copy, which humanity can actually use as a pretty large exploit. They copy, but have difficulty discerning their own versus the non-afflicted. And this is how some humans were able to survive the invasion. But now, like I said, I'm really hoping we get a part two because I'd love to see how this whole thing turns out. But